Okay, I'm going to continue. This is the third class. Um, this is sort of a break in two weeks, but hopefully we'll start to get it on the schedule of being every Wednesday. So we're up to here. We're up to that. We, we just started. We opened the book. And we have a book about something called Kabbalah, which is another way of saying, at least for the Ramak and for the standard stream of uh, Mechabalim, the mainstream, another way of saying the knowledge or the science of the Ten Sefirot. Now, what are these Ten Sefirot, and how are they, and how do we know that they are, and what are they for? These are all questions that we'll slowly, very slowly get to. And the way that Ramak organizes his book and his his science in general, at least in this book, uh, there might be different ways of putting it in, in later versions, is by asking on everything, as we do in Talmudic studies, as the halacha is organized, where does it say? Right? Where is it written? Where is it written in, in, in Jewish is another way of saying, how do you know? Right? Very famously, we have Mishnah uh, Sanhedrin, it says, if uh, someone says, uh, if you say that the resurrection of the dead isn't in the in the Torah, in the Bible, in the, in the Torah, that's another way of saying you're denying it. There's different... Uh, uh, commentators uh, being worried about what does this mean why, why doesn't it just say he denies it but I think the simple answer is that this is just this is how you say it in Jewish in Jewish you say something doesn't exist you say it doesn't say that's at least the way in which uh, the Jewish knowledge is construed we could talk about you know there's a lot of discussion about this and this is definitely the way Ramak sees things or at least the way he presents them if that's entirely the way he sees it is a very uh, serious question but at least that's the way he presents it both here and every place where he talks about uh, how do we know things are and he generally says that because they say so saying that where it says is another way of saying who says that it is or where does it say right and it's in Jewish slang also we can say sometimes people uh, want to deny something and they say it doesn't say anywhere or where does it say that such and such so that's that's his language so now and in this he's correct and this everyone I think agrees that the Ten Sefirot, at least the word Ten Sefirot, right? even if not the concept and the way he understands it, but the word Ten Sefirot, we inherit from this ancient text called Sefer Yitzira. And as he himself knows, it ascribes itself to Avram Avinu. This is not clear if that ever, was ever meant to be taken literally. It might be it's just a kind of Midrash that says that Av, Avram Avinu uh, understood these things or he worked on this science and different ways of understanding why that would be the case or why he connects it to Avram Avinu that's another discussion but at least the book itself connects itself to Avram Avinu and but that I think that was never meant to be at least the Ramak himself you see him being says enormous chemist right so in other words there are some things that Kulam is skimu right Kala if you go a little earlier you see the amount of Sfirot Kala is Chachma is Pechot everyone agrees that there are 10 Sfirot of course based and going back <coughs> the Sefi Yitzira. Not everyone agrees who actually wrote the Sefi Yitzira. It's Mechuned. It's it, it itself ascribes itself to Avram Avinu. Some say that it's ascribed to Rabbi Akiva, who was one of the greatest Tanoim, and many mystical texts and generally traditions get ascribed to him. That's another possibility. Uh, according to modern research, nobody knows. We still don't know. It still seems to be a work of the first centuries, so possibly still in the times of Tanoim, so it at least speaks the language of the Mishnah, which makes us think that. Others have all kinds of different uh, speculations, but definitely an ancient text. Now there's, like the Ramak says, there's a many interpreters of this. We discussed this in the last class a little bit of giving some of the story. I don't remember how much of it we gave. The story of interpretations of this book we did what we did, what I do remember that we did is we went through what the big, most basic term says. The most basic term says that there are something called 32 Nitivot Chachma with which the world is created. And these 32 Nitivot Chachma are 10 Sefirot, something known as 10 Sefirot, and 22 letters. So 10 and 22 is 32. These are the 20, 32 uh, Nitivot Chachma. Now, at least for the Ramak, at least for the tradition of, of Kabbalah in general, the 10 Sefirot, as we discussed, are more primary than the 22 letters. 22 letters might be some sort of articulation or, or elaboration of the 10 Sefirot, which we have to discuss when we get to Shadow Isias and different places where it discusses the meaning of the letters. But to him, everything is explained in terms of Sefirot, right? But the Sefirot himself, 
they need to need to have a lot of explanation. And at least the way he frames it here is that let's talk first about this number 10 of 10 sefirot, right? He is not going to talk firstly about why there has to be a number 10. There's a whole discussion later. So this is in together along goes along with his general methodology of asking where it says a lot before he asks why or what it actually means. Because to him, where it says is where everything starts. But we have to start reading, in the most basic sense, what it says in this first Mishnah. This is the first Mishnah, and he quotes the first Mishnah. It's not literally the first Mishnah in Safi Yitzira, but it's the first Mishnah that introduces that introduces the concept of ten Sefirot. And now we need to uh, start to understand it. Now, to give the most the most basic, and I'm just going to give one piece of preface and way of preface to this, if, which we might have not said yet. The basic question in the interpretation of Sefer Yitzira is what does this exactly mean, this word, the world was created with 32 nitivot or 10 sefirot and 22 letters, right? Now, in the language that the Sefer Yitzira is, Bishloshim Vishtaim Nitivot Chachma, Chakak Bara et Aulamo, Vechule. The uh, one interpretation which existed in uh, in medieval times before Kabbalah was started get started going, which if you find it of Sadigon and the, the Sefer Kuzari in certain ways and so on, is that this is be means out of, right? So the world was created out of these thirty two ingredients, and we go on to explain how what this means. In other words, and that the way the Kuzari presented it and the Sadigon in similar ways was that the Sefi Yitzira was trying to answer the very ancient uh, philosophical question known as the question of the one and the many. And the way the medievals, the way the Kuzari presented this question is very much connected to the concept of monotheism. And this is why he connected to Avram Avinu, because Avram Avinu is said to be the discoverer or the first one who um, uh, publicized monotheism. And they, But it's not really a question that starts with monotheism. It's really a question that starts in... In philosophy, in, in natural philosophy, in, in the beginnings of philosophy, at least we find this in the Greeks being very worried of this, and all tradition that we have of philosophy starts there. And their problem, sort of, at least the problem, the way that Kuzari says it, and to explain what this problem might mean is not for now, but in basics, that the way the Mechabulim generally presented is, and the Kuzari, that if there is one God, how is there many things in the world? Now, this is really a question about the world itself. How many things are there in the world? Or what does basically the world consist of? Now, since we want, to, uh, at least if for monotheism, you want to find some sort of unity in the world, or f by some assumptions that lead you to think that if God is one, then he should create only one thing, because, because of some principle of proportionate causality, something like that, which says just like uh, green things cause things to be green, so one thing should cause things to be one. And since the world, at least as it presents itself to the senses in the beginning, is very much many, very much varied, there's thousands of different kinds of things, or at least as many kinds of things as you know, there's trees and animals and people and all kinds of different things. And this presents a question for the theory of the world coming out of or being created by the one. And therefore, at least this is the motivation that uh, Rabbi Dalevi presents for the Kuzari, therefore there was a motivation, and of course this is sort of the ancestor of modern science in many ways, to find the one, either the one rule, or the one principle, or the one substance, or the one uh, cause, that can be said to be the one within uh, all the many. And at least starting by, um, by reducing the amount of things in the world. So on this, where we get ancient theories of uh, basic elements, things like that. There, all these theories are creating radical simplifications, saying, okay, you think you see 10,000 things in the world. There's really only four things known as uh, the classical elements. And those four things themselves we can reduce further. And somehow, at least many ancient philosophers arrived at it being only one thing in some in different ways. And then, of course, that one thing somehow becomes all the other things or is all the other things and so on. But at least that explains the question of the one God being the source or the cause of everything else. So now, 
and didn't say all of this to discuss the problem of the one and the many. I said this to, to explain that according to this theory, and according to this interpretation, which is the non-Kabbalistic interpretation of the Safi Yitzira, when the Safi Yitzira says the world was created with these things, he's not saying a statement about God in any sense. It's a statement about the world, the world that you might think is such and such. Really, the secret of the creation, the secret of Maaseh Bereshit, which is Safi Yitzira, tells you what the world is really created of, or what the most basic ingredients of the world are, and he gets them down to 32. Now, how he got, and those 32 actually go down to 1, if you read, at least according to a certain reading of Safi Yitzira, you could find how it goes from 1 to 3 to 7 to 10 to 12 to 22. So that's how it all sort of ends at in this sort of pyramid where 1 becomes 2 and 3 and so on. Um, but this is all about the things in the world, right? So basically about physics, basically about what the philosophy of nature is or what the knowledge of nature is to find out how many things it's made out of. So according to that understanding, and of course this has theological implications just like everything, especially in basic uh, the philosophy of nature has important theological implications, but it's not directly about God. It's a story about the world. And when it says, Bishlo Shim Vishtayim, the world was created with these things, it means to say, these things are what constitutes the world. Maybe in earlier stages of the world, this, there were only these ingredients, and then later God mixes them, and like different descriptions have it, and so on. The uh, earliest Mechabalim already, so we find this interpretation of Safi Yitzira in the, <coughs> in the Bahir, in the Zohar, they all, and if you read the classic interpreters of Safi Yitzira, which he will be referencing right away, Rabbi uh, Yosef Ashkenazi uh, wrote a, important commentary in Safi Yitzira, which is known as the Pirush Ravid, but it's not the Ravid, it's an early Mechabal known as Rabbi Yasef Ashkenazi, and others, Rabbi Yitzchak Slagi Nohar, they all understood the B, and they explicitly say this, I'm not making this up, the B of Bishlo Shem Vishtayim, which the Safi Yitzira starts with, as meaning in, or within, or through, instead of uh, out of. In other words, they understand the Safi Yitzira as being about the things We'll get to understanding what these things are, but we could, we call them tentatively sfirot, with which the world is created, not the things out of which the world is created. And there's this is delicate because there are ways in which these turn into be the mean have the same meaning, but it's important to differentiate this. So it's not the ingredients of the world, which maybe these ingredients themselves were created, maybe these ingredients were internal. That gets us to another question, but it's not at all talking about this. It's talking about the basically we could say the parts of God, we'll get to um, uh, qualifying a thousand times what that means, but the attributes of God, or the aspects of God, whatever you want to call it, who with which the world was created, or we could say the thoughts of God, or the actions of God, these are all metaphors, so we'll get to understanding at least what Ramak means by this in Shad Dalit, but generally, in other words, instead of reading the world is created with 10 sefirot and 22 letters in the sense of the world was created out of. So these are the matter that constitute the world, at least the primal matter in the beginning. There's, it's really not even talking about that. It's going a step earlier, and maybe this the second step is also true because it mirrors the earlier step. But we're going a step earlier into, so to speak, the mind of God. And this is literally the language that the early commentators of Sefi Yitzira talk about, the mind of God. So in other words, the world was created with these by, or we could say by these thirty, these 32 things, or by these 10 sefirot. The world is created by these 10 sefirot. Of other words, in simple terms, we say the world, anyone that believes in creation and some kind of creator, they says the world was created by God. Another sefirot is complicating the vision, and complicating the vision or the understanding of God, right? They're saying that when we talk about God, at least God as the creator of the world, which is sefirot tzira, the book of creation, right? or forming might be a better term. The Sefi Yitzira itself gets into this, but we're not talking about this right now. Um, we're saying the world was created by Ten Sefirot, or by God's Ten Sefirot, which of course need to be, this this connection is, uh, needs to be qualified, but that's the way they understand it. In other words, this this flip changes the Sefi Yitzira from a story about the world and how it was created and the science or the basic particles, the basic ingredients of the world to a story about God. Not telling stories about God is, of course, a very fraught endeavor, very <laughs> complicated, especially in monotheism, just like this whole story, according to the first understanding, started with problems of monotheism and based on the idea of one creating one and why would one create many. Of course, this only this understanding of these ten being in God only transfers the problem from the world to God himself or to these attributes of God or to these tools of God. However, we'll see what they mean. 
known as Firat, it just transfers that problem when we can ask the same problem, and the Mechapalim definitely ask this problem, just like the philosophers of nature asked how, or theological philosophers of nature, right, would ask how would many things come out of the one God, you could same ask the same question, how would many Sefirot come out of the one God, and we'll see him right here, even starting to touch on these on these problems or these questions, but these are the basic uh, understanding, this is the basic story of how we got how the Mechabalim flipped the understanding of these ten Sefirot and in general the understanding of Sefi Yetzirah. Again, we could talk about, think of, but pri- primarily the ten Sefirot according to their understanding, which is another, right, it's another part of what their Chiddush that they say, because simply we might not know. We might, yes, but we could debate if the Sefi Yetzirah has meanings to prioritize the ten or the twenty-two. But in any case, the more important move that the Mechabalim do is change Sefi Yetzirah from a book about the world, or about, in other words, about physics, about the nature, into a work and directly about theology, or at least directly about metaphysics, directly about things of God or the science of knowing God. Okay, so that's uh, a very important uh, preface. Now, again, since Ramak is here for reading things, and you could see right away, he starts, and now just so we understand, the moment you start saying that this is really the science which is about God or godliness or something about God himself, this leads us into an almost impossibility of an, of having the gods or having the chutzpah to interpret this, right? This is really where he's, what he says, that this Mishnah has such secrets and nobody can grasp its depths. Maybe Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, maybe Rabbi Akiva, who... He reads This is language from Sefer Daniel talking about uh, angels, or it's, it's actually uh, saying that uh, the only person who can have certain knowledge, this is really why it's very, it matches this language, it's appropriate, is people who do not live in the flesh, right? And meaning angels are certain, some kind of celestial beings or gods. Um, right, this is Nuchadnetza when he had his dream, and he, want, he said that. Uh, Nobody could interpret his dream, nobody could solve it for him until he found Daniel, and Daniel had his dream, his own dream, which told him the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And then Daniel t- and Nebuchadnezzar says, well, wow, you have knowledge, you have godly knowledge, right? That's basically what he's saying. And he might, he might literally mean gods because he's, an, he's a polytheist, he believes obviously in a bunch of gods. So he's saying you have literal godly knowledge, and of course this is what is appropriate to Kabbalah and to the Ten Sefirot in the Kabbalistic interpretation, which is literally godly knowledge or knowledge of God or knowledge about God, and therefore you basically need to be a god to understand it. And since people are not gods, though there's a big problem with understanding, but at least maybe there's a way, and we'll get to it in a moment at some point, maybe there's a way to grasp things that are beyond human comprehension or regular human comprehension, right? Human comprehension is not a not a binary thing. But anyways, he says, but, that so that's really what we should have left this all, and basically, which really means we should have left this whole science to two people who are angels, to some kind of abstract beings, <laughs> which don't have bodies. But since, since we are obligated, so, of course, where we get this obligation, there will, is a discussion in our narrative and other places, but we are obligated to try. And this is a very important uh, principle for him, right? We are obligated to try to understand God and creation as much as as much as we could. So we'll explain it as much as we could. So now he gives a list, and this is his, his methodology of of reading things, and very we have to get used to it and at least in some uh, in some point because this is his way of, of learning and although it's some not the way we're used to even people that read very very deeply and very since closely and don't usually do this kind of list of questions. This was the uh, generally accepted methodology for reading, uh, for close readings of texts in his in his day. And we could see it in other earlier texts of of that period, and slightly earlier, slightly later, people had this way of thinking of organizing. It's really very organized. It just <laughs> it just <laughs> make tiring. It just uh, gets into things. But let's try to look at the Mishnah and try to look at his questions. Not really, these questions they're somewhat formulated in like a very nitty gritty way and very. Uh, ways of asking sim- very simple things, but there are true questions. All of the questions are not they are not made-up questions. They're not uh, random questions. He's trying to s- show you how to do a close reading of a text like this. How we, and this is maybe one of the important things to learn from him. And of 
course, people could disagree. Maybe the texts were not meant ever to be written as closely. Definitely a text like Safi Yitzhida was meant to be written closely, and it's meant, of course, after figuring out which is the correct version or the correct text itself, it's meant to have every word should have a meaning. So, let's start his questions, and then he'll start giving his answer. Not really his answer, but more of his interpretation of the Sol Mishnah. And he said, this is what Mashiach Ledaktik, this is the the Ukim, this is the comments or the questions we can ask about this. So his first question is, we now this is the first Mishnah again, it starts, Eses Firot Belima. He, didn't, he doesn't make that a question, but that's obviously a question, what in the world Belima means. This is language that we don't find anywhere else. It's not language that we could, uh, there might be an interpretation for it in Sefer Yitzira itself, which we'll get to, but... And it might be based on a pasuk. We'll get to all of this, but it is, we don't literally have this language. Eses firot, the word firot is not a not a word that we find in any other Chazal uh, uh, text. Besides for this, and belima is also not known. But okay, we'll get to understand that. But that's not really a question for him. The question for him is the next language, and it says mispar eser right? So the ten firot belima are the um, count, the amount, just like there are ten fingers. So and he's going to start try to draw out mostly this this understanding, and we'll get to it. Understand it. Just let's try to read his questions. So he's saying, what his question is? His question number one is, mispar seems to be a word saying something. So mispar, of course, means number. Right? That's literally, the word for number. So it's saying, if he just w- if the sefer would just want to tell us that these ten sefirot have some sort of correspondence with the ten fingers of a human. Right, you should just say mispat eses firot belima keneged eseret spot. That's the standard rabbinic word for correspondence. Keneged, right? So against, but against in the sense of corresponding to ten ten fingers. And of course, we have to ask what that means. We'll get to that in a second. And that's his five question number five. What is what he's even doing with these fingers here? But first, he wants us to notice the word mispat. And to him, this is a very important word. And of course, the word firot itself might be some sort of permutation of the word mispat or number depending on how you want to ter- choose to read the word Sefirot, but that's at least one of the meanings, that it means number, or at least connected, or from number. So this this word mispar, so this ten Sefirot, the amount, the same amount as there are fingers, seems to be showing us something. It seems to be saying that we should uh, read uh, the ten Sefirot to have something to do with number, and this is an important, an important word. Okay, so that's his question number two. Now question number two, and this is the next part of Sefi Yitzira, and he does like this. It says, Chamesh, can I get Chamesh? Five against five. So here, or five corresponding to five, right? Five, uh, opposite five, maybe. Not clear what can over here means, but here you see him using the word can so he might have been able to use it earlier, but he didn't, so it means something, this word mispat, right? So, Chamesh, can I get Chamesh? Now, this is a very important, this is really the point uh, around which the next three chapters, more or less, and, and Pradis will be revolving around. And it's not really what you want to hear when you're starting to learn Kabbalah, but this is what he does. And it's starting to figure out a sort of structure that exists in the Sef- in the Ten Sefirot, which the Sefi Yitzira talks about in this first Mishnah. And, and uh, the way he understands it, if this is the first Mishnah, this is the first Mishnah in the world that talks about Ten Sefiras, then we need to see this 5 versus 5 structure as being some sort of important structure in Sefirot, right? So, and again... And we still don't have anything to know what these things mean, but in the most general we, we assume, and we'll talk about what it means later, but first we know and everyone agrees, and we'll see later if it's true that everyone agrees, but that we have something called a number 10, there are 10, these things known as Firot, there are 10 of them, okay so we know one thing about it, there are 10, not 11, not 9, 10 and we now know an- another thing which is of course important, at least as long as you're just thinking in this formula right, 10 is a number now numbers or amounts or count again these are different things but we can think about them can be organized or can be structured in different ways right it could be one 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 that's ten or they could be three 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 one that's ten or they could be four six that's ten there's a lot of different ways to get to ten it could be one two three uh, <laughs> one two three four together is ten there's a different ways to get there's a lot of different ways to get at ten and these different ways whether it symbolizes or whether it shows or at least they're different structures and a lot of, a lot of, at least there's a whole shah said that Atzilut and other sharim, a lot of the uh, things that we're trying to get at is really the structure. And, and what kind of structure are we to understand these ten sefirot, right? And of course, later different different makabalim have totally different structures and ways of understanding it, which 
mean different things. So now the first and the earliest, and this is important, people don't generally read it this way. We generally, when we learn Kabbalah, we don't focus on this structure for various reasons. But the Sefer Yitzira's first structure, or first, uh, some sort of internal structure, right? The, tens, the ten is the outside, the container, and then this container of ten is divided into two and two, and he did, and he associates with your hand, right? Just like ten Sefirot starts with a hand having ten fingers, so there's two hands, hand doesn't literally have ten fingers, there's two hands which together have ten fingers, right? So five on the right hand and five on the left. And this five and five, and associated with right and left, is the most, the first structure that the Ramak wants to analyze and try to give names to it and try to explain it, what it means and how it works. So, and this is what the Sefi Yitzirai means, but we need to understand why. The second question is, what is this Chamesh Kneget Chamesh even doing? What, what, is, what does he want over here from this? Because that's the first thing. So Mispar Esed, it's pot chamesh, keneget chamesh. That's what uh, the Sefi Yetzirah uh, said, right? And that was that's our second question. So we want to know what number is doing here. We want to know what this five and five is doing here. Now he's going to uh, talk about the whole uh, structure of how the Mishnah gets. And the Mishnah says something like this. This is his reading of it. There's different versions of the text itself here which complicate things, but his, his version of it is like this. There's five against five, five versus five, or five corresponding to five, right? Five on each side, so he's thinking ten sefirot, five, and the amount of ten fingers, five, five, and something in the middle. Ubrit yachid mechuvenet be'emtza, and they're one, so the single brit, whatever brit is supposed to mean, covenant, right? But what is he referring to here, we don't know. Be'milat lashon uv'milat ma'or. So there's five and five, and something in between them. Okay, and that thing in between them somehow has two of them, something called Milat Lashon and something called Milat Ma'ar. It's not clear what these things are and what they are for, but we'll get to that. So now, then we get to our th- his third question, which is a very simple sim- simple question, which is that if he just told me there are ten, and then you sort of went and explained, what do I mean by these ten? I mean five, five, and one. Well, that's eleven, right? So what's going on? Either there are 10 or there are 11. So, and if this split yachid is important, then it should be counted. If it's not important, then why are you talking about it at all? So, what's going on, right? And then, question number four is, what is this milat lashon or milat ma'or? So, in, in at least the way the Ramak reads this, milat lashon means the milah. So, brit is the brit milah, right? Brit, brit milah, right? And the uh, Ramak understands this to mean, and that there are two Brit Milas, and, or two ways of talking about Mila, because Mila can be read as word, Mila is a word, and Mila is the Brit Mila, so Lamul, so we cut the Brit Mila, the circumcision. So, and this is, seems to be at least one shot of the Sefi Yitzira, which is really a shot. The Sefi Yitzira is saying that there are two Britot in the body of a person, just like the body of a person somehow has, symbolizes or has or reflects the ten Sefirot in his ten fingers of each hand, of course, we have to talk about the fingers of your feet. I've also ten, and there is also a mila or a brit mila in the middle of a person. These are in the middle of a person, right? So, yeah, and you have your mouth, which has a tongue inside. Milat lashon, the word corresponding to the lashon to the tongue. So that's one, one brit, and second brit is milat maor, and maor he understands as meaning the um, the place where. You make a Brit Milah, which is called Ma'or, based off a uh, language like Erva. So, Ma'or, Erva. This is a language that we could find in Tanakh somehow. So, Ma'or is the Milat Ma'or. So, the Milat Lashon and Milat Ma'or. These two things need to need to have a, have a Milah. Different senses of Milah, but he associates them. And these are two Britot. Now, of course, we don't understand. Maybe even if someone would tell you, okay, we need something. And we'll see later that this is an important thing for them. We need something to sort of be Machriah. So Machria means to, uh, how do we say, to be in the middle, to uh, sort of uh, uh, make peace between, or peace, or to mediate, to med- mediate is the correct term, to mediate between the right hand and the left hand, we need something to mediate them, so something to connect them, or to mediate them, exactly what this means, there's a whole shah called Shara Machriim, later to explain what this is supposed to mean, but, and, okay, let's, we, let's say we understand that, we still don't understand why we would need two of them, what's going on with this, uh, two, right? Why would we need two of them? Okay, that's another question. That's question number four. Question number five is what is this whole whole let's doing here, right? In other words, 
why okay it's very nice like we could find ten there's ten sfirot and there's just like there's ten fingers five and five and one in the middle okay therefore well, what is this going on this is and he says this is, doesn't seem to be his subject here if his subject would be and like he's going to say in, in number six if that would be true that's really what he means to say if it would be true that his subject is and this is a legitimate subject as he tells you to look in Shara Nishama, which is in the last the literal last shot of but it's a very important subject for Kabbalah and that's why that last shot is an important shot Right, which is the correspondence of the the limbs, of the, par- the parts of a person, of a human, with the parts of the Sfirot, which is an important correspondence for, for Kabbalah. That's a nice thing. So then, if you'd want to do that, then why is he just talking about ten fingers? He should talk about ten hands and feet and fingers and stuff like that. That it seems to be what he should be doing. So either he's doing that or he's not doing that. Uh, in any case, we don't understand what this Mispar Eser spot is really... Uh, all about okay so this is these are his six questions that you should think about and of course there are more questions in, in this in this little mission that to ask basically what is all what is all what is going on right what is he even saying i need to say one thing just about the thing he said last because of what we're trying to do is some sort of somewhat of a critical reading right we don't have to believe everything he says um this idea of the ten sefirot corresponding to the ten or s- certain parts of the human body or the human anatomy in some ways is a true, uh, that's um, an idea that we find in Zohar and that's a Kabbalistic idea. It doesn't seem to be to be something that the Sefi Yetzirah would agree with, at least not in this in these ways. Because if you read Sefi Yetzirah, again, Sefi Yetzirah is a simple text, although the meaning or what it's about might be very not simple. But the basic text of Sefi Yetzirah and the basic uh, structure of what he's what he's even saying is really simple. Now the Sefi Yetzirah talks about these ten sefirot in the first chapter as being the most basic thing, let's say, in some way. And then he does actually have a whole chapter where he talks about the human body and parts of the human body and then different powers that he ascribes to exist in the human body in a very complicated way. And he definitely does not associate those with the ten sefirot. He associates those with his 22 letters and the three letters emesh correspond to three parts of the body the however sort of divides the body into three parts the head and the rosh bet nobody exactly knows what kviya is but that's what it says and then he says seven seven lower letters seven letters after that we got kaprat correspond to more parts of the body then his 12 correspond to powers in the powers in the body so therefore it seems to be untrue at least in the simple version of Sefi Yitzirah to say that the ten Sefirot correspond to the body. It's true that he corresponds them or connect them to the ten fingers. That's true. That we have to understand. But he does not. So this question, this last two questions, which really are, are one question, which just says that if he's talking about the correspondence of the body, should they say all of them, is not a question for the Sefi Yitzirah's own system, which corresponds to body to things in his system, but they are the ten letters and the and the... Uh, the 22 letters and, and different configurations of the 22 letters and not the 10 sefirot, which he seems to understand as a more abstract or more refined principle which don't actually correspond to these uh, parts and powers of the uh, body. Of course, so that's my comment. Of course, the Mechabolim, since they do associate they do associate the 10 sefirot with the 22 letters themselves, right? Because because their system gives primacy to the 10, ten, ten sefirot, they have to then fit in the entire 22 somehow into this. So, of course, the fact that the sef for them, the fact that the sefi associates the body with the 22 and the 7 and the 3 and 12, really, which is 22, in a different way, it doesn't uh, preclude them from ascending to it to associate to the sefirot. The sefirot themselves need to be differentiated somehow in terms of these twenty-two letters and so on. So it's not really a, some problem for their system. I'm just saying that if you want to read the sefirot itself, this is not really a question for the sefirot itself. Okay, so up to now we've read his list of six questions, which are starting to show us one of his important lessons for us, which are how to closely read text. He calls them questions or the yukim. Now we're going to move on to his, really his interpretation of this Mishnah, and then after that, which we won't get to today, it goes goes into a very elaborate discussion of how exactly to organize the five and five and the mediating parts in, in between them, and what exactly that would mean, and there's three different opinions, and, and so on. <coughs> 
So the first thing he says is like this. He says, this is his solution to the problems, but it's not really, really we should read it as his interpretation of this Mishnah. He says something like this. This Mishnah is not really only about giving us certain correspondences or certain details about this Firot. Really, it's a much more important and fundamental and foundational Mishnah, since this is the beginning of Sefi Yetzirah, right? This is the beginning of where we start learning and start teaching about Sefirot. So it's really, and in a very short way, it's, it's Nistar, it's hidden, it's not uh, very clear, not very articulated, but it's really, in a hidden way, trying to show us the proof, or the proof text, at least, for the entire idea of Sefirot. That's what he says. Kiven lahastir. So it's both to give us the basic theology or the basic ideas of the Ten Sefirot in a very short and uh, um, a concentrated way. And also to sort of prove it or to sort of show where it comes from or how it comes out of really it's coming out of text. He's not doing a philosophical proof, but he's at least doing a textual proof some, somewhat. And both of these things are, done, are not explicit, right? Both of these things are written, this Sefi Yitzira is definitely written in, in riddles and so on, so we should not expect everything to be explicit, but these are the two things that he understands the Sefi Yitzira doing in this Mishnah, and in general in this very short text, both giving us the uh, essence of Chumata Sefirot, of the science of Sefirot, and giving us the proof for it, or the source for it. Okay, so first, what is the essence? What is What are these Sefirot? So, we know one thing about them, Sefirot. Or two things about them, that they are Sfirot and there are ten. Those are the two first words of this of this Mishnah. Now ten, what is 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 what? It's a number. A kind of number, at least. It's a number. Now this te dramat means that they have some kind of limit and some sort of source of or some sort of uh, corporality corporeality. Right? So, Gvulvagashmut, limit and embodiment. Why? Because to him, and this, this needs a lot of explanation, and I not, do not exactly know it, or, nor can I exactly do it right here. But to him, uh, being counted or being enumerated, being, being able to be counted, and especially, so there's really two things, two things in this fact that we can count them to 10. One is that they and all can be counted, right? In other words, the way um, he understands the infinite, the true infinite, right? Not really correct to probably call it, to say the word infinite, but the true absolute, the true uh, eternal, the true infinite is not counted at all, right? It's called Echad Pashut, the simple one. The simple one, or the basic one, or the uh, eternal one, or the, um, how they call it, a true one, right? The true one is not counted, so it's not infinite nor finite, because these concepts are all related to number, and in order to have be counted, in order to have a number, you need to have be the kind of being that has numbers. <coughs> in other words, to be limited by a body, that's the base, his basic understanding of it, that the thing that makes things in the world have numbers is the fact that they have bodies, so we could say one table, two tables, one person, two people, and so on. And in that sense, even if there would be only one person in the world, he would be one. So at least he would be a numerical one, right? He would be one by number, because he is the kind of thing of which we speak about as having numbers, and it makes sense, right? There could be one person, there could be two people. Okay, we don't really need two people for the one person to, be, to make sense, although it might not be very interesting to count only to one. But even counting to one is still a counting. This is to be contrasted with the true one, which we call one, but by analogy it's not really correct to talk, call it one, or later we call it one, but not numerical one, right? He talks about this later. The one who is not the numerical one, which is the language of the philosophers that say, Echad mispar, the one who is the not numerical one, means he is one in the sense of not being two, or not being differentiated, or not being um, divis divisible, and so on, or not being limited by anything. So this might be ways of, we might understand that to be one, but it's not one as a numerical one, right? So that now that's about the ensof or the simple one or the true one. These sefirot are not the ensof. Of course, this is very shortly and very concentrated way of getting at really things that need long and long discussions. But his basic saying is: the f if we talk about something that is numbered, 
right? Besides, doesn't even if we would say that there's one sefirah, right? Doesn't matter. That's the first thing. The fact that it's numbered, the fact that it exists in a way that it can be counted, already implies that it's not as infinite. It's limited in some way. Of course, he gets very elaborate and very qualifies this ten thousand times that it's limited, but unlimited, and so on, because we do need this to be somehow godly and so on. But it's at least not as uncounted as the true one, right? So it's eser at spot. Eser. Eser means that they are. So there are two things, right? One is that they are the kind of things that can be counted, and two, that there is more than one of them, right? So, which means they have... Uh, uh, not, there's not only one. There's not only one sphira, there's ten of them. And which means that they meet, must be differentiated one from an, from another, internally to themselves, they must be differentiated by some kind of limit or some kind of uh, being a body in some way. Maybe not a body in the way we're a body, but in some way, they need the fact that they're counted and the fact that there's more than one of them, that they're counted not only as one but as ten, shows us some sort of limit. Now, of course, this is the paradoxical thing that he wants us to get at. I don't think he really thinks that it's a paradox, but he thinks that it's very, at least in the beginning, we speak in paradoxes. This is this language, literally the language that he says. He says that's the, what the next word means. As is firot, things that are counted and are ten. But belima, and he reads belima as without essence. Beli mahut. Mahut is, of course, the uh, medieval Hebrew word which translates the word essence, in, in, well, essence in English or in whatever the word was in Latin and Greek. And he reads this, and this is not a very good chat because. Again, to be critical, because like I'm saying, the word mahut is literally an invention by Ibn Tiban or someone like that. I think Ibn Tiban writes that he invented it, and it's to translate the Arabic uh, word for essence and taken from the word ma. Of course, ma in, in Hebrew means what, and what in some is really where the word essence comes from, because in Greek, uh, I forgot how they say it, it's really another way of saying what or what is, something like that. So it sort of makes sense, the etymology of it, uh, to, take, to, to make ma into a thing, right? Ma is a question, and to make it into a thing, mahut, which is what a thing is, or the essence of a thing. That's what mahut is. But this way of speaking was not didn't exist in ancient Hebrew, it only exists in medieval Hebrew and so and further. So this interpretation of saying beli ma as meaning uh, beli mahut is not a very good pshat, histor- not a very good historical pshat. It still might mean something similar to this in the Pshat of Sefi Yitzira. So, um, at least in, uh, we're going to see if we read Sef- later in Sefi Yitzira, and he connects these two things. But we'll get to it, because the Sefi Yitzira later says, as is firot belima, belom picha. So, and he seems, and this is also a, a word in Iyav, which is tole eretz al belima. And it's possible that Sefi Yitzira is making a midrash on this word, tole eretz al belima, as the word hanging or the word the world being contingent on something called belima, and he understands this belima to be ten sefirot belima, and maybe even one word, maybe he, def- he understands it or or, or darshins the word belima to mean belima, or without something, without what. Maybe he does, is thinking of some sort of what, which we might call essence. Um, but he, he himself reads it as, or at least, and one way of reading it is miloshon belom, to close or to... Uh, uh, refrain from speaking, since we cannot, it cannot be spoken, and maybe cannot even be thought, or in the beginning at least cannot be thought simply. So that's belima. That's another really reading of belima. He's himself going to going to discuss that reading here or in other places. But at least his first and his most basic, and this because this is a, the essential interpretation, right? The ontological interpretation is belima without essence. So belima is an, either an a connection of these two words, belima, where it's itself means to say that, but in any case, belima, so in other words, he's contradicting himself. And that's how he says, that, that's what Ramak says, although, although we cannot, keep, uh, we cannot um, be careful enough with our tongue, with our words, our words are not precise enough to get at what we mean. That's a very important uh, thing for, at least for the Ramak and for the most Makabal, that they don't believe that words are precise enough to get at what they mean, or at least they don't have precise enough words. A criticism and a, a, at least a complication of these kind of theories of saying that they're not enough, the words are not precise enough, maybe you just don't know the right words or don't know the definitions of words, right? Of course, there could be a scientist or a philosopher that has very technical terms that have very precise meanings, but in regular speech and day to day speech, it's impossible to do, to articulate that level of depth or that level of exactness. 
so we use words and say contradictions, but in technical terms, it's not contradictions. There might be something like that going on here also. But at least he says we might say 10, but we believe these 10 to be, to be essenceless. And what do I mean essenceless? So it doesn't mean literally essenceless, because of course, of course they exist. They have an existence, at least an existence, which might mean another, again, depending on how you wor- use the word mahot or use the word essence, but at least the way he qualifies it here is, says, Akavanash en mahot musag el adam. So it's, they don't have a graspable essence. So in other words, of course, as if not R10 in some way, and we need to qualify that or contradict that by the paradoxical saying, they are 10, but n- without essence. Right now, how is ten and essence the opposite? Only by way of understanding, right? They're simply not. It's not saying they're ten and they're one, which is uh, something that other people might say or might say later. But he's not saying that they're ten and one. He's just saying that they are ten in some way, but they are not limited in another way. In other words, when he sa- he reads ten, uh, and slightly in a more abstract sense than it says, right? He says when you said when it says ten, you really need you need to read that say- as saying they are limited but unlimited, or limited, which is another way of saying having graspable essence but do not have a graspable essence or not entirely right so that's it's really the contradiction that he poses here and he says clearly that this is a problem that we have in our mouth but we do not have in our mind or he says that in our in our faith or in our belief we don't believe a contradiction i don't want to get too much into this and we don't believe the con- a contradiction, but we might say contradictions because of the limits of our language or because of us not having a refined enough language as yet. Or at least when we speak to regular people, we might being, have to say contradictions in order for us to show these two aspects of the thing, that on one hand, these firot are limited, and they can be spoken of as limited. On the other hand, they are unlimited. When, and this is another way of saying unknown. So this is an important an important. Uh, thing that I really think is uh, very controversial and very radical in the way he says it. It's not clear to me that it's true at all. But what he says is that humans, and this is his term, we, at least in what he calls regular perception or regular understanding, cannot grasp things that do not have limit or body. And that's not precisely true, right? It's only true, and he himself goes on. He says, Mash enogesh, if something that does not have a body cannot be grasped only, belev maskile am bnei Yisrael, derech reut kmo b'nevoa. So this, this, these words, to me, are very important, at least very important in understanding what he's even getting at in his whole, in his whole system and in his whole book. And what it means is, I'm going to try to go slowly here. So to repeat, I want to be very clear. He tells us that these words, Eses Firot Belima, is a sort of paradox, which doesn't mean the paradox, but it's at least a paradox in the simple meaning of the language, because it's saying limited, unlimited. And of course, if you remember, it's not, it doesn't say in the Mishnah limited, it says 10 Sfirot, which you understand to be countable. And when he says Belima, it doesn't say unlimited, it doesn't say Beligvul, right? It doesn't say Ensof. Later does say, don't you think? It is said, Midatan Eser Shen Ensof, so it might be analogous to what it's saying here. But here it says, without essence. Now, of course, essence, and these are not the same concepts, essence and limit and body, all of these things are three different concepts at all, that he, uh, for now at least, combines into one into one uh, concentration, into one little thing, because he wants to start you and into getting into these thoughts, but I don't think that he himself confuses them, I think he understands that these are different concepts and they might have separate sources and so on, but limit and body and essence what he's trying to get at here, and there's places where he gets into these things in detail, but we're trying to keep to his basic thing, is that you need to understand this Firot as being limited in some sense. In other words, really, in other words, relative to the true one, they are limited, but relative to us, they're unlimited. I think that's a very basic way of saying it. it might not be entirely, he might not entirely agree with this, but what do we mean by unlimited relative to us, or unembodied relative to us? What we mean is that we do not understand them. Why? Because humans, in general, understand only embodied things, only bodies, only things that we can see or imagine as having a limit, and things that are not, mashe no gash, things that are not gashmi, right, that are not embodied, they're not limited or not embodied, can be grasped, but only, and this is his language, only in the heart of masculine, of people with, with, with sechel, of uh, people that understand, in the way of seeing, like prophecy, 
Now, I think that here he's doing a very radical move, and I'm not sure if he himself means it entirely in this way. Again, there's places where he gets into these questions, and, and especially in the book Elima, which is his later version of all of these ideas, which where he just speaks under his own authority without doing this whole text analysis thing. He talks about this. But what he seems to be saying is um, somewhat the opposite of what the philosophers would say. So the philosophers generally understand, and the philosophers, I mean the medieval philosophers, where we have Jewish philosophy from, generally understand that the mind, the human perception, always starts with with sense, 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 with senses, always starts and then goes to imagination. In other words, imagination is just the word for sen- for internal senses, for imagining something, that you're seeing something which is not in front of you. Maybe memory and imagination work together in this sense, in this sense, in this way, in this way right? That we can see something. So I see a, I see a table, I see a cup, I see a, the sun and the moon, so I can see it. So I have an image, that's the sense. They, they understand that to be a very basic uh, lack of understanding. And then... I could talk. I could also think about or imagine the sun when I don't see it. When it's at night, I could still imagine the sun. So I have an image in my mind of the sun, and I'm still seeing it. Now, both of these things are not understanding; they are seeing or imagining or remembering in an imaginary way. In order to get to understanding, to intellectual understanding, we need to abstract from this, and then. We need to abstract from this two concepts, or two, really not concepts, they would not say the word concept, right? They would say two intellectual beings. In other words, um, there's a limit to human seeing or to human imagination, and the limit is that we can only see things that let us see them, things that have bodies, things that have uh, take up space and have color and things like that. There's not the precise definitions for body for the philosophers, but we would think of it like that. And you would say that you can see things that can, that allow themselves to be seen, then I will imagine things, right? And stories, all kinds of mythological stories, they're all speaking in the language of imagination, right? Even something that might not have actually existed, we could still imagine it, and so on. Now, there are things in the world that are not seeable, they're not visible, or they are intelligible, right? For example, an angel, or for example, God, or for example... Even more basic examples, the forms of things for, for Aristotelians and so on. The substantial forms of things are in the world, they're in the things, but they cannot be seen. Or we talk about universals, the concept, or what we would call concepts, right? The idea of a, a man, or the idea of the form of something, or math, mathematical relations, anything like that. They're intelligible beings, they might understand them to be beings, but we cannot see them, but we sort of abstract from seeing the things, slowly we f- get to the level of intellect, and the level of understanding things, and which which means that the, the mind and the imagination, the human the imagination cannot see, cannot grasp anything that doesn't have a body, while the mind can. The mind can grasp things that do not have a body. Not only that, that's all the mind is for. The mind, when we talk about mind, when we talk about intellect as intellect and as as the as differentiated from imagination, what we mean is the intellect can grasp and, and touches or grasps things. They're not bodies, concepts, or causes, or angels, or uh, separate intellects, or kind of things like that. And they can be grasped totally. And that means really that's the word essence, right? And the word essence. Now, the essence of things, which, and in the philosophical understanding, there's still an understanding which is what he's at least basing off. Is, is really the part that only the mind ever sees, right? Nobody has ever seen the essence of a human. It's not something that's seeable. You could see a whole human, which has essence plus body, plus maybe not entirely plus might be in that correct way, but plus all the embodied parts of it. But the essence is not ness, might be in the body, but it's not a body. And that can be grasped if you are a scientist, if you learn, if you have an intellect, then you ha- see, or seeing is and said all here analogously, right? We don't literally see, but we intellectually see or grasp or understand the essence of things, right? So essence for philosophers, or again, for philosophers, seeing or imagining is for things that are seeable, things of this world. Understanding or grasping is for essences and un- and same as uh, for unembodied things. And they might have essences and different essences without bodies, basically. The 
Ramak over here, and there's a tradition to thinking like this. He's not the first one. I think Rabbi Dalevi thinks in similar terms, and other um, more mystically inclined people. They think almost entirely the entire opposite of this, and it's hard for me to understand what exactly they mean, but they think almost the entire opposite of this, and they think what the philosophers call um, understanding, they basically identify with imagination. And they say, the only I'm not sure if this is exactly correct, but they basically say that, they say something like this, they say the human understanding is more limited than the human imagination. Well, he talks about prophecy, but in a seeing way. Maybe This, this might be only an analogy, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, or actually don't think that this is really the opposite of what the philosophers are saying, because they're really trying to get a step beyond what the philosophers are saying, so not negating them, but trying to go on beyond. But just in that level, it turns out to be something opposite. In other words, when the philosopher says he sees the essence of a thing, he understands the essence of a thing, for the Mechabolim, that essence is still, he would still call that a Geshem, he would still call that a body, or a limited thing, at least. He would say it's limited by being this essence and not some other essence, and limited by being countable, maybe, and so on. And therefore, even though I'm not talking about a literally embodied essence, and everyone understands that, I'm not talking about something that you can see with your physical eyes, with your fleshy eyes, you cannot see it, but you could see it with your mind's eye. And to him, this is still a sort of imagination, or in other words, it's still a sort of limited physical fleshy understanding. When they talk about Sefirot, or they try to talk about things that exist but without essence. So without essence is really one step beyond what the philosophers are getting at. They're trying to say there is something that is does have no essence, or what you call essence, in other words, the definition, or then this the conceptual definition of a thing, which is its essence. We have things we want to we talk about that we think that we can get at things that have no essence. In other words, this might be a weird way of saying, of speaking, right? We have to remember if our language stops making sense, that we might be saying that they do have essence. What, what we, that's why we're saying, of course, they have essence in the sense they have existence. They're not non-existent things, but they are not graspable in the way that we grasp essences, right? They're not uh, intelligible to the mind in the way that essences are intelligible, because intelligible essences, in order to be intelligible, need to be limited. And in other words, and they understand limit to be some sort of kind of body, at least, maybe not a physical body in, in the bodies that we see, but bodies that we could think of. So it still, see, still calls it a body, analogously, maybe. But it's an essence, so it's limited. And the things that he wants to talk about, they're unlimited. And here, there's a flip that happens, and he claims, and that's what they claim, at least, that the things that are beyond intelligible things, they're not accessible to the intellect either. Just like, in other words, just like the essence, the intellectual essence are not accessible to the senses. In the same way, the sefirot, or the things beyond intellect, are not accessible to the intellect. Right? But how are they accessible? How do we know about that? Of course, if you, if you would stop here, that would be fine. Because then he's just saying, talking about things that we cannot talk about, so you should just be quiet. Right? But they really go on and say that that's not entirely the truth. So we still, we can grasp things that have no essence. How? Not in a physical way, not in an intellectual way either, but in a prophetic way. And the prophetic way, we call, he calls it seeing, and because he calls it seeing, or sometimes they call it a third eye, or sometimes they call it taste, they call it different kinds of things, but what they mean by taste is not the lower taste, not the way in which we see physical things, or really literally embodied things, but the way in which we can, we call this taste really just to differentiate it from intellectual grasping, right? In other words, we say something, that something, and this is how it gets used usually, but I think that it, you need to remember that it's trying to be three steps beyond that, right? You say something, I cannot describe it, I can't articulate it, but I feel it, but I, I have a vision of it, and some sort of prophetic language of vision, right? I have a third eye vision of it. Um, but usually this means just that I don't know what I'm talking about. But at least what they're trying to get at, what the Ramak is trying to get at, is that there's things that are not Geshem. So of course, things that are not, not not bodied can be grasped by the intellect. But he thinks that there are things that cannot be grasped by the intellect either, but can be grasped by some sort of faculty, which he calls prophecy, or he calls like prophecy, or he calls like seeing, in the way of seeing, which is like prophecy. And it sort of has, it might have the attribute of being more analogous to imagination or more analogous to seeing than to grasping, because grasping, they understand grasping to be more limited in some way 
than seeing because seeing in some way at least i don't know why i think this is just an, a metaphor maybe the word seeing but at least that's what they think that you can sort of see and the kuzari equivocates on this he says both ways or sometimes he says it's the literal imaginary seeing but it's of beings that are not really to be seen so they're just showing you in some way that's one way or you could say that these are this is really what he probably is getting at that it's beyond both seeing and grasping but we describe it as seeing just so you can understand that it's so we should. So you shouldn't think that it's grasping. That's really what he's that he's getting at. Anyways, that's. But that's his understanding. And right. So again, in basic terms, this this is what he's saying here would be the opposite of what the philosophers say. Because the philosophers say that what is not Geshem is the only thing that can be understood. Is what can be into intellig- intellectually grasped, is accessible to the intellect. And he is saying sort of the opposite and what they say about the imagination, that imagination can only grasp physical or embodied things, and the intellect can grasp. So maybe, in one way of understanding, would be to say that what he calls derech k'mon benevoar is really the same, or identical to what the philosophers call intellectual grasping. But I think, and explicitly, I think he says this in Elima in different ways, that he's trying to get past that, and the Kuzari says, sort of understands it to be, get past that and say that, we are talking about things without essence because that's that's the only way we can understand what he says when it says that it's without essence because essence is literally the non-physical thing and to him essence means physical thing in other words he's thinking of essence as being the limit of something something that's limited something that's defined in some way and to him that's a problem the moment it's defined in some way that means that it's somewhat embodied or somewhat limited with in other words it's not the true one it's not the totally unlimited thing and of course going back to the tense firat in some sense they are limited or at least we'll say relative to the one they are limited, relative to the true one, relative to the end stuff. And in some sense, they are not limited. In other words, we cannot entirely grasp them with our uh, discursive minds, at least directly, and at least not ex- at least not immediately. Okay? And that's how he understands it. And then he says, that's why he goes back and says again, and according to him, mispar why the reason it, it repeats itself and says the word number, the amount of Esther it's bought, is to emphasize this point, right? It's really saying the same thing again, saying that although we are talking about something with a number here, uh, so we're to- so it's going back and forth. First it's saying it's a sfira, it's a number, then it's saying it's belima, it's essenceless. And then he goes back to say, although it's essenceless, it's still uh, mispar, right? It's still still a number in some sense. So you should not make the opposite mistake and say that there's only a true one and the, these fetus these fetus don't exist. They do exist, but they are a number and they're not a number. So that's what he's saying. That's why they're called sfirot, which is means number or means numbered things in some way. And they are belima and they are mispad esedet spot. Okay. So that's his first important point about the essence of sfirot. I'm just going to finish the second point about the source of it and he says the source of it and, and then to his understanding this is and this is this he copies from this Rabbi Yasvashkenazi known as the Pirush Adafit it says, says the same thing it says that the, when I talk to Sefi Yitzhak talks about ten fingers he's not trying to just give you some uh, information about the fingers or something like that what he's trying to do is give you a source for the ten Sefirot why? how is how's this show us? because the Pasuk says Ki era shamecha ma'ase et secha so the Tehillim, poetically, but obviously, but uh, one of the big things of Kabbalah is to read poetical things as referring to beings in some sense, to, to spheres, basically. It says this, Tehillim talks about this, the heavens, the skies, as being the work of God's fingers, right? There's more, there's more language like this. This is actually a pretty common language in Tanakh to talk about the creation as the works of God's hands, right? In other words, analogously to humans, like a human creates with his hands, so we imagine at least God creating with his hands. And not only hands, sometimes we see him talking about etzbaluhim, right? God's finger. That's one language. The Paris said etzbaluhim. And he especially quotes this, this book in Telem Kapitel Ches, which says, talks, it's a general. Um, chapter about creation somewhat in some sense and talks about seeing the heavens which are the handiwork the work of your fingers in other words reading kabbalistically 
like we said, so the Kabbalah reads the creation of the world with the 32. So the world created with God's fingers, as if God has finger, fingers, which we're going to associate with his sefirot, and with them creates. So in other words, where do, where do we get this idea that God has somehow 10 things with which he creates the world? We get it from the image of God having fingers, and how many fingers does a human have? 10, right? So he has 10 fingers, and 10 fingers are the 10 sefirot, right? Fingers are not literal, not meant to be understand that he has fingers, but meant to understand that he creates the world via these 10 sefirot. So that's the simple source for 10 sefirot, and that's what the Sefer Tzira says. In other words, since we know that the Bible tells us that God created the world with his fingers, and we know that there are 10 fingers, it doesn't say that, but we know that by ourselves. So we understand that there are 10 sefirot. Now he goes on to explain that chamesh keneged chamesh, the reason why he starts talking about five and five, and this is already, and then going even further when this idea that the ten sefirot are based on the imagery of God's fingers creating the heavens. So he has a question because there's a pasuk in Yeshai that seems to say that the heaven and the earth were created by two separate hands, right? So therefore. We said so the heavens, the creation of the work of your hands. We understood that to mean both hands forming the heaven. In other words, ten sfirot forming the heavens, or maybe including the earth, but over the heavens over there. So we said there's ten sfirot. Now, there seems to be a complication with this because in different places there's actually a lot of psukim that talk about God's hand, right? In the sense of one hand. Of course, the stories of Yitzhak Mitzrayim with Yad Agdola and so on. But explicitly, he's going to he refers to this pasuk which says, "Af yod yaste eretz v'yemini tipchashamayim." So my hand founded or created or established earth, and my right hand created or formed tipcha means formed with your hand tefach the heaven, right? And he understands this to mean, and we could read this 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 pasuk in different ways. Maybe it's talking about the same hand. Maybe it's just a poetic uh, repetition which is probably is, but he understands it to mean my left hand created the earth and my right hand created heaven. That's how he understands it to mean. Might not be the literal translation, might not be the best understanding of this of this uh, pusik. I would understand it to mean my hand and my hand, the same hand. I don't think we have to imagine God as having two hands in this, in this pusik because po- po- biblical poetry generally works with repeating itself. So I don't know. And generally, we would talk about God's hand, you would say his right hand, just for the reason that right hand usually symbolizes, because most people are right-handed, so it symbolizes the stronger hand, so we talk about God's strength in the image of his hand. But that's that's all I'll peep shot. I think, by the way, definitely do want to read hand and hand as talking about two hands, because we need two hands for a tense if not, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work. And basically understands this chamesh kneged chamesh as, as preempting this question. So someone would ask you, why did you tell me that you've, there's ten sefirot because the heavens were created by God's ten fingers? It's not true, they were created by five fingers. Five for the heaven and five for the earth. So you should tell me there's only five sefirot, right? And he preempts that by saying chamesh kneged chamesh, that yes, I'm counting both together. So I'm counting the heaven and the earth being created by God's right, this, let's assume that this is true, that the right hand and this sort of associate with the heaven being the higher, the more powerful part, so it corresponds to the right hand, and the earth being the weaker part. Of course, this has other meanings, so it corresponds to the left hand, which is the weaker hand, generally. But, but it's chamesh, keneged chamesh. Both of them were created by God, right? So why would we say that there's only five sefirot because he created the heaven with five hands, with five fingers? He created both, the heaven and the earth, and both together add up, they sum up to ten Fingers. So Chamesh Kenegid Chamesh is trying to say these is trying to connect the five and five. In other words, we'd have one pasuk that talks about fingers, and we have another pasuk that talks about two hands, which are separate five fingers and five fingers. In order to, to say that, in order to get the correct number of sefirot, you have to add up the right hand and the left hand. It says Chamesh Kenegid Chamesh in order to uh, show us that there are two. Uh, that these two should be counted together as ten, and not as not only as five. Okay. Now, of course, you can ask questions on this. This is not entirely uh, enough, and he himself asks a question on this in the next part, in which talks about maybe we should talk about twenty sefiras, and so on. We're gonna get to this uh, next time, and then to his understanding of what the five and five. Maybe we'll try to elaborate a little more the understanding of the of the how we got this out of this ten sefiras that have these ten fingers. But that's enough for now.